good evening and welcome to this service of evening prayer from St Peter's Shipley Online. It's great to have you with us this evening wherever you're joining us from tonight. We're going to be thinking a little bit more in our service tonight about some of the uh, things that we learn from the early church um, that are still relevant for us now about what it means to be a Christian. And today we are thinking especially about the theme of every Christian a minister. Um, and we're going to be looking a bit later in the service with John um, at the book of Ephesians and about what that tells us. Um, so we look forward to that a little bit later in our service. But as we start, let's just take a moment to be quiet and let's ask the Holy Spirit to come amongst us as we begin. In the beginning, when it was very quiet, the word was with God. And what God was, the word was. In the beginning, when it was very dark, God said, let there be light. And there was light. When the time was right, God sent the sun. He came among us. He was one of us. So let us pray. You keep us waiting. You, the God of all time, want us to wait for the right time in which to discover who we are, 
where we must go, who will be with us and what we must do. So thank you for the waiting time. You keep us looking. You, the God of all space, want us to look in the right and the wrong places for signs of hope, for people who are hopeless, for visions of a better world which will appear among the disappointments of the world we know. So thank you for the looking time. You keep us loving. You, the God whose name is love, want us to be like you, to love the loveless and the unloved and the unlovely, to love without jealousy or design or threat, and, most difficult of all, to love ourselves. So thank you for the loving time. And in all of this, you keep us through hard questions with no easy answers, through failing where we hoped we would succeed and making an impact when we thought we were useless, through the patience and encouragement and love of others and through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, you keep us. So thank you for the keeping time and for now and forever. Amen. The reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 57, um, verses 14 to 21. Someone will say, build a road, build a road, prepare the way, make the way clear for my people. And this is the reason. God lives forever and is holy. He is high and lifted up. He says, I live in a high and holy place, but I also live with people who are sad and humble. I give new life to those who are humble and to those whose hearts are broken. I will not accuse forever, nor will I always be angry, because then human life would grow weak. Human beings whom I created would die. I was angry because they were dishonest in order to make money. I punished them and turned away from them in anger, but they continued to do evil. I have seen what they have done, but I will heal them. I will guide them and comfort them, and for those who felt sad for them, they will all praise me. I will give peace, real peace to those far and near, and I will heal them, says the Lord. For evil people are like the angry sea which cannot rest, whose waves toss up waste and mud. There is no peace for evil people, says my God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. Christ gave each one of us the special gift of grace, showing how generous he is. That is why it says in the scriptures, when he went up to the heights, he led a parade of captives and he gave gifts to all peoples. When it says he went up, what does it mean? It means that he first came down to the earth. So Jesus came down and he is the same one who went up above all the sky. Christ did that to fill everything with his presence. And, gave, and Christ gave gifts to people. He made some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to go and tell the good news, and some to have the work of caring for and teaching God's people. Christ gave those gifts to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving, to make the body of Christ stronger. This work must continue until we are all joined together in the same faith and in the same knowledge of the Son of God. We must become like a mature person 
growing until we become like Christ and have his perfection. Then, we'll, then we will no longer be babies. We'll, be, we'll not be tossed around like a ship that the waves carry one way and then another. We will not be influenced by every new teaching we hear from people who are trying to fool us. They make plans and try any kind of trick to fool people into following the wrong path. No, speaking the truth with love, we will grow up in every way into Christ, who is the head. The whole body depends on Christ, and all the parts of the body are joined and held together. Each part does its own work to make the whole body grow and be strong with love. In the early chapters of St Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he spends a lot of time explaining what God's purposes are for the church. And it's a very high calling. In chapter 3 and verse 10, he says, God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to God's eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It was always God's intention for the church to be the means through which his uh, purposes were revealed to the world. And he explains at the same time that God does not have a plan B. Uh, it is going to be the church which achieves the purposes for which God has called it. And <clears throat> that's a, a very interesting uh, thing to think about because uh, we can uh, very easily become quite cynical about the church and uh, about the fact that uh, it is often riven by division. It hasn't in the past lived up to the calling that Paul describes here. But that doesn't mean that God is prepared to, uh, to sideline the church or somehow to go to a different plan. God is going to stick with that. And uh, as the letter to the Ephesians continues, Paul starts to explain what that will mean in practice. And as chapter 4 opens, from which our reading tonight came, he starts to talk about uh, living a life worthy of the calling that you have received as part of the church and being humble and gentle, patient with one another in love. Some fairly obvious things to begin with. But then he starts also to talk about how the church is organized and about the fact that in pouring out his Holy Spirit on the church, God has given particular tasks and ministries to certain people who he has called. And in chapter 4, verse 11, uh, he begins to describe what some of these gifts are. It was God who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare or equip God's people for works of service or ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up. So Paul identifies in the church of uh, his own time um, these uh, what we might call ministries. Uh, apostles, for example, uh, which we can uh, describe as people with pioneering ministries, uh, church planting, perhaps setting up new churches and fellowships, organising churches in cities where uh, no such thing has existed before. Uh, he also talks about prophets, not so much uh, those who are foretelling the future, uh, but those who are speaking out the word of God. And uh, he describes uh, their ministry in detail in 1 Corinthians 14 um, for building up the church and for encouraging God's people. 
Uh, there are evangelists, and um, that's uh, a bit more obvious, those who proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, who lead others into a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Some to be pastors, those who have pastoral gifts, who are shepherding the flock of Jesus Christ, looking after uh, people. And teachers, those who are able to look into the Word of God and to teach the faith to others and to, uh, and to encourage sound doctrine, for example, within uh, the people of God. This isn't an exhaustive list. Um, in other places in the New Testament, Paul uh, describes other uh, what you might call ministries, uh, some of them fairly simple. Um, ministries of administration and of helping others which are very high callings indeed and amongst those is leadership. Uh, there were certainly leaders in the early church for example James the brother of Jesus who was identified as the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, so churches in the first century were not all necessarily ruled by uh, boards or groups of elders, although it, that was the case in, in many cities. Uh, but in some places there were leaders who were, were singled out as those who God has called. And uh, Paul says, well, this is how the church works, that there are those who are called and gifted um, in these ways, but all of them to prepare, or that word can mean equip, God's people for works of ministry. There are indeed gifted people in the church, but every Christian is a minister. And that has a purpose as well. So that, he goes on in verse 12, the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. It's an acknowledgement that the church is not a perfect place. There's a lot of work to be done within the church, not just to ensure that evangelism goes on and that people are being led to Christ, but to ensure that Christians are being looked after, that they are being built up, that they are growing in their faith, and that the whole of the church, both locally and uh, perhaps nationally and internationally too, is moving towards a sense of maturity and unity through the power of Jesus Christ. And that task is not just the task of a few people who are called out to these special ministries, but it is the task of every Christian to be involved in that kind of ministry. And therefore, every Christian needs to be concerned about getting equipped for the task to which God has called them and that they are taking responsibility for their own spiritual growth and growing in faith. Now, <clears throat> this is particularly important for us now because as we look at uh, our own situation now, uh, we can see that there uh, is plenty of work to be done with the church. And perhaps that historically, we haven't quite uh, understood what Paul is saying in this passage about how the church should be organized in a particular place. As we've seen, he doesn't exclude the need for leadership and for leaders. But leaders are not people who are there to do all the ministry. Leaders are there to lead and to follow the calling to which God has given them. And they may not have uh, some of these other gifts, the pioneering gifts, the evangelistic gifts, the pastoral gifts. Um, these are in the church but they need to be identified, they need to be encouraged, the church needs to be built up. And every Christian needs to use uh, these, uh, these gifts and these, uh, these particular people as sources of their own equipping for 
ministry. And so um, as we think about what kind of church we want, uh, some of these processes uh, are we need to be doing. Are we looking for the gifted people in our midst who are able to uh, encourage and model to us uh, the kind of things that all of us need to be doing to some extent? Can we see in our midst people who have pioneering ministries of various kinds? Can we see in our midst people who may have prophetic gifts in the sense of being encouragers uh, for the church, speaking God's word directly into the lives of men and women? Can we see uh, where the evangelists are, those who seem to find it straightforward to talk about their own faith and to lead others to Christ? Can we see those who naturally fit into shepherding and pastoral roles? Can we find the teachers? And can we find others too who perhaps uh, don't find it difficult to slot into some of the roles Paul talks about elsewhere? Ministries of helping, ministries of administration, and ministries in the various spiritual gifts that Paul talks about in other parts of the New Testament, gifts of healing, uh, and so on. Uh, in every church, Paul suggests, there is some of that. And uh, as well as having leaders, are our churches identifying those gifts and beginning to release those people into ministries where they are starting to equip others to do the work of ministry so that we can say not that our church has a minister but that in our church every Christian is a minister. Now that's the vision of the church which Paul is outlining in Ephesians which he expects the Ephesian church, which we know had a lot of problems within it, that he expects the Ephesian church to start seeking after and to establish um, in their midst. And this finds its way into scripture because it is a word for us to follow too, as we think about what kind of church do we want and how should we be developing church life. Let's pray that uh, instead of perhaps looking to the past at things that have uh, happened and that sometimes have worked quite well for us, we might look into this particular passage of Scripture and seek to say, well, how can we develop that here in Shipley in the 21st century? How might that work? Where are the people who can equip us in these kinds of gifts? And can we come to a place where we can say our church is a place not just where we have leaders and gifted people, but where every Christian is a minister? So let's use these words to affirm together what it is that we believe. That we worship one God Father, Son and Holy Spirit, in whose image we are made, to whose service we are summoned, by whose presence we are renewed. This we believe. That it is central to the mission of Christ that we participate through word and action, to rejoice in the diversity of human culture, to preserve the earth in all its beauty and frailty, to witness to the love of God for every person and to invite all to share in that converting experience. This we believe. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, the persecuted will be lifted up and the wicked will fall. The heartfelt prayers and hidden actions of God's people shall change for good the course of human history. The ancient words of scripture shall continue to startle us with fresh insight. This 
we believe. That God has called the church into being, to be a servant of the kingdom, to be a sign of God's new order, to celebrate in every land worship which raises our hearts to heaven. This we believe. That Christ, fully aware of our differences, prays that we may be one so that the world may believe. This we believe and to this we are committed for the love of God in the way of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so let us pray for the church and for the world and let us thank God for his goodness. Knowing the deep love that surrounds us and reaches out to us in every distress, we bring our burdens of care to the healing power of God our Heavenly Father. Lord God, we pray for the work of the Church and we bring before you the Church's work among the homeless, the disillusioned and the apathetic. We pray for the work of the Church amongst, amongst such groups throughout the world. And we pray for those parts of the world to which we are joined through our mission partners. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you, Lord God, all areas of the world where lack of communication breeds suspicion and fear where lack of understanding breeds insecurity and a spirit of revenge. We pray that you will use your church to bring reconciliation in all such places. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we bring before you each member of the community of which we are a part. We bring before you each individual anxiety and sorrow, each hope and dream, each weakness and each special need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you, Lord God, all whose lives are crippled by unrepented sin or by the refusal to forgive. We pray for those whose lives are constantly restless and devoid of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you, Lord, the joy and happiness of our daily life and thank you for the blessings that lift our hearts to praise you. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And the alternative collect for today, the Sunday before Lent. Holy God, you know the disorder of our sinful lives. Set straight our crooked hearts and bend our wills to love your goodness and your glory. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And gathering our prayers and praises into one as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. So thank you for sharing in this service of evening prayer with us this evening. I hope you found that a helpful time. So let's pray together as we go into the week to come. God of the watching ones, the waiting ones, the prayerful and positive ones, the angels in heaven, the child in the womb. We pray together. Give us your benediction, your good word for our souls, that we may rest and rise in the kindness of your company. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>